my name is Christina Müller and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Aeronet Neuron Coordination Team. In Neuron, we are very eager to overcome the gap between scientists, patients and lay people in general to increase transparency and also the credibility of science in society. Therefore, it's a great pleasure that you have all gathered here today um, to listen to the second issue of our lay lecture series, which I'm very happy to open with a brief introduction to the Aeronet Neuron. Neuron is actually an acronym and stands for Network of European Funding for Neuroscience Research. We are a network of funding organizations who join forces to promote disease-related brain research. Over the past 15 years, 28 countries and the European Commission work to together to follow this aim. Um, we focus our efforts on translational brain research and translation in this context means the step where results from basic research, for example, in animal models, are translated into clinical research approaches. This is a very critical step to bring new concepts and new ideas for therapies and diagnostics to clinical practice. This research on the threshold between basic and clinical science can address different topics in neuron. For example, neurological topics like head trauma, pain, stroke, or epilepsy, or psychiatric topics like depression, autism, or ADHD, or even overarching topics like the development of new methods. So how does that work? How do we fund research as a network of European funders? We launch each year an international, or as we say, transnational call for research proposals. And for this, the funders agree on a certain topic that needs more research. And after this call is made public, researchers can apply for funding if they work together with researchers from other countries. So if they form a research consortium. The um, research proposals are then evaluated by scientific, ethics, and also patient reviewers. And the neuron funders only provide money for the best projects addressing highly important questions in the area of that call. These calls for proposals are the central pillar in Neuron to promote brain research, and we are very successful in that. Um, in the last 14 years, Neuron spent um, more than 160 million euro to fund 189 research consortia, which included 800 research groups. But besides that, Neuron has also much more to offer. We um, lobby at national and European level to promote neuroscience and to interconnect researchers and other stakeholders across Europe and beyond. We support young neuroscientists, for example, with our excellent paper award or privileged access to high class trainings, workshops, poster sessions, and much more. And of course, we want to connect science closer to society by engaging patients on every level, by providing YouTube educational videos, by informing the public via social media, and of course, by having this lay lecture series today. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, hand over the word to Professor McGuire, who, will, um, who is a leading scientist at King's College in London and who will talk about um, prevention in mental health. Thanks so much. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip McGuire. Can you see me and hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, um, so um, first of all, uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to give you this lecture. I hope it will be um, interesting and helpful. Um, what I'm going to do is, is just um, share my screen so you can see my slides. Um, I'm, I have to speak in English because um, I can't uh, do anything else. 
Um, um, but um, I'm very happy for people to ask questions um, during the presentation, or you can wait until the question and answer session at the end. Either way is, is fine for me. Um, so I will get started. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. So is that okay for everyone? Perfect. Okay, so so um, I'm a a, a, a I'm a professor of psychiatry uh, based in uh, London, and um, I'm going to talk to you about the possibilities and potential for prevention in mental health. So um, the first, th this is really a summary of what I'm trying to cover today. Um, so first of all, I want to give you an idea of the extent to which prevention at the moment is part of routine mental health clinical care. Then I'm going to talk about the importance in relation to prevention of prediction. Uh, and in other words, trying to predict when, if somebody is going to develop a mental health problem in later life. And then finally, talk about the, the potential and the possibilities for prevention in practice. So um, the first point is really about if, if we look at mental health care across Europe, let's say, in um, to what extent is prevention part of that model? And the answer is n almost zero. Um, so at the moment, in most countries, mental health care systems, for, for a number of reasons, are set up in a kind of reactive way. In other words, the model for most disorders is to wait until a person becomes unwell, sometimes quite seriously unwell, and then to provide care after the illness has begun. And this is true for uh, schizophrenia, for depression, for anxiety, for substance use, for, for almost all disorders. It's quite unusual um, to have any kind of prevention built into um, existing healthcare. So um, there, there may be some small variations of this depending on the condition and depending on the country, but, but overall, you know, the bulk of mental health services at this point in time are not designed to be preventive they're designed to be to treat something that is that has started so um why would we be interested in prevention why has nobody done this before um well it's very it, it's very relevant to mental health disorders because i mean if we had fantastic curative treatments for mental health disorders, then maybe prevention wouldn't be so important. But in reality, we don't have um, treatments that cure mental health disorders. Almost all of the treatments um, that are available can reduce symptoms, and that can be very helpful, but they can't cure the disorder. And many mental health disorders are, are chronic uh, sometimes lifelong disorders and so not being able to um, treat them in a kind of um, a way that would remove the disorder completely is, is a big problem for mental health. So um, prevention would be a, um, a very attractive solution to for, for mental health. If we could stop these disorders beginning in the first place, that would be a lot easy that might be easier to do than trying to, fix them once they're well established and we we know for many of these disorders they are they are intrinsically difficult to treat once they are established so the first point is that in theory prevention could be a more effective way of treating any any illness not just mental health disorders but any disorder um secondly uh, it, it's probably from from my experience it's a much more acceptable approach to the the patient than dealing with the problem after it's well established so when we talk to patients and we talk to their relatives um the idea of trying to be proactive rather than reactive is is quite an attractive approach and then finally there is a health economic consideration in that 
treating um, established disorders over maybe a whole lifetime is very expensive. And, and mental health disorders are very common and they tend to persist and be chronic. And so the health costs associated with treating these disorders are very high. If they could be prevented, it may be possible to treat these conditions in a less expensive way. So there's that for all these reasons, there, there has been a lot of interest in the potential of prevention in mental health among clinicians and researchers for some time. And within mental health, the area where this, this, this kind of approach has been most developed is in the treatment of psychotic disorders, disorders like schizophrenia. And there's a number of reasons for this, which it's not important to go into, but suffice to say that over the last maybe 20 years, there has been a huge interest in trying to find ways of preventing the onset of psychotic disorders particularly and there's been probably more work and more more um, knowledge about this than say for depression or for eating disorders or other psychiatric disorders and so what i would like to do today is use psychotic disorders as a, as an exemplar for all mental health conditions because the principles of the approach in terms of prevention are the same, whether it's depression, substance use, eating disorders. It just so happens that it's been uh, evaluated more for psychosis so far than any other condition. And so we can learn a lot from just looking at psychosis. So I'm going to focus on the, in the rest of the talk about psychosis. And also that is the, in terms of mental health conditions, that is my kind of specialization. So um, that's the area that I've been personally working in most. So I, I'm familiar with that work. Um, more than in other areas. So when I say psychosis or psychotic disorders, I'm talking about disorders like schizophrenia. Um, these are um, common disorders. They're, they can be very disabling and they affect a, a large proportion of the population, maybe two to three percent of all adults. So among all health conditions, not just mental health conditions, um, psychotic disorders account for, uh, they're in the top 10 in terms of um, the, the, the difficulties and the, the disability that they can cause people. Um, so it's a huge problem um, for society and for, for health services. And um, the main features of these disorders are, can be divided into three categories. Um, what are called positive symptoms or positive psychotic symptoms. So believing things that are not true or real or having unusual sensory experiences, which are called hallucinations. There are also negative symptoms, which refer to a lack of motivation, a lack of enthusiasm, a tendency to withdraw socially from, from the community. And then finally, um, difficulties with all aspects of thinking or cognition so planning um, organizing things um, uh, remembering things so this is what psychosis how psychosis can affect people and um, across Europe uh, and the world the, the, the incidence of psychosis varies quite a lot depending on where you live um, within Europe the, the, the highest incidence is in big cities like London Paris Amsterdam and in in more uh, in less less urban places um, like um, Galicia, for example, in northern Spain, the incidence is much lower. So you can see on this graph um, how the the number of new cases per head of population varies quite a lot, um, depending on the geography. And um, we don't exactly know why that is, but um, it's probably to do with the, 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 the geographical variation in risk factors for psychosis. So for example, we know that in one of the biggest risk factors is being an immigrant or being the, the, the child of an immigrant. So for example, in big cities like London, Paris, Amsterdam, um, if you are an immigrant or the child of an immigrant, your risk of, of psychosis is much higher than in, in the population that has lived there for many generations. 
Um, we know that stress is very important and it may be that stress as a child is more important than stress as an adult. So if you have um, experiences of uh, psychological trauma, um, abuse during childhood, that seems to be a, quite an important risk factor. And then living in a big urban environment um, like London, for example, it itself seems to be a risk factor. So um, in the big cities where there is a high rate of these disorders, you have a, a, a kind of perfect storm of all these different risk factors in one place. And um, they, they probably add together to, to increase the risk. So most mental health disorders um, begin um, relatively early in life. Psychosis um, becomes clinically um, uh, evident in an obvious way in, in usually in early adulthood around about the age of 25. And that is called the, what it clinically is called the first episode of psychosis. But actually the, 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 the symptoms begin um, some years before that. They're just not so obvious. So in, in psychotic disorders, what's emerged in the last 20 years is that there is a kind of high risk period um, in usually in early adult life where um, the patient has less severe symptoms, sometimes called attenuated symptoms, which are the same kind of symptoms as you would see in say schizophrenia, but less severe. And, and this happens in this high risk period here in the, usually in the early twenties. Um, so um, this, this high risk period and the, the emergence of symptoms in this phase is a relatively recent um, scientific discovery. It's only in the last 20 years or so that this has be become clear. And this has generated a lot of interest in, well, if people are having kind of um, prodromal or warning symptoms um, in an early phase before they develop the disorder, this opens the opportunity of um, prevention because you have a group who are displaying kind of warning signs, and that might be a way of um, targeting this group um, to try and um, introduce a preventative treatment. So this, this period before the onset of um, frank illness is called the clinical high risk phase or the clinical high risk state. And that it, 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 it refers to a uh, a clinical syndrome so it just means a collection of mild psychotic symptoms that are associated with a high risk of progression to full psychotic symptoms in one or two years so typically these individuals will be young adults typically at the sort of age that would be attending college or university and they present with um psychotic experiences like feeling a bit paranoid or um having unusual sensory experiences, but still retaining the ability to continue with their work or their um, educational activities. But this is often associated with a, a, a drop in their overall level of functioning. So the student will notice that they're having to work maybe twice as hard to achieve the same grades at university, for example. So this is a this is the high risk state, and and the, the the important thing to understand about this high risk state is that it doesn't inevitably lead to illness, but it's associated with a very high risk of progression to illness, and and I'll show you that in the next slide. So, in this group of people who have this kind of clinical high risk syndrome, within about two years, about one in five of people with this clinical picture will progress to a full frank psychotic disorder so this is this subgroup here and then another 80 percent or so will not so the risk of developing psychosis happens very fast in in one or two years so if people who present with the syndrome if they are going to become unwell it will happen very quickly but the majority of people with the syndrome will not develop psychosis so this is this is the scenario if there is no clinical intervention okay so if you do nothing one in five people will develop the illness four in five will not and um 
over the last 20 years, um, mental health services have begun to recognize this uh, high risk state and set up clinical services for these individuals. So until about the year 2000, um, there was no mental health provision for this for people like this at all. Um, it, this has only been recognized very recently. Um, in the year 2000, we set up this service in London called Oasis, which was one of the first services specifically for this high risk group. And um, the idea was to try and make it possible for people who are, who are young people who are experiencing these symptoms to um, contact mental health services and get advice on what they should do, what what is going on, and so on. And we um, we deliberately set up the service in a kind of non clinical uh, environment. So in this case, this is a, a like a, an office building in central London rather than a hospital or something like that, because we were aware that patients in this high risk state are quite cautious about contacting mental health services and maybe sometimes afraid that if they contact mental health services then they may be locked in a hospital or treated against their will or something like that so the the idea with these kind of um what are called early detection services is to make them very friendly and accessible um and and a kind of non-clinical appearance so that people are not put off about coming forward because it takes quite a lot of courage for somebody who's experiencing these symptoms to volunteer um, what is happening to them to a, to a clinical service. So this is a relatively recent phenomenon, not just in London, but across across the world, but, but only in the last 20 years or so. And um, one of the, the, probably the main challenge working as a clinician in these kind of services is that we discovered fairly quickly that it was impossible to predict which of these individuals who presented with this syndrome would progress to illness and which individuals would not because the clinical picture is the same um, in these two subgroups. In other words, the people who subsequently develop psychosis in the next year or two look exactly the same clinically as the people who do not. And this is a big problem because it means that we can't People come asking, okay, what is going to happen to me? And it's very difficult for us to give them personalized advice because we don't know. And secondly, if we if we had some kind of way of preventing progression to illness, um, based on the clinical presentation, it wouldn't be possible for us to selectively give that to the people who really, the 20% the who are most vulnerable to developing illness in later life. So it would be much more efficient if we could offer in a selective way uh, some kind of preventive treatment to the people who, who really need it most, that 20% that I mentioned earlier on. So this kind of clinical problem has driven a research, a huge global research effort to try and identify other measures that would allow clinicians to differentiate between people with this syndrome who are going to develop a full-blown illness in one or two years and people who will not because clinically no matter how, how long you interview people and how well you assess them you can't tell the difference so um in the last two decades there has been a lot of research around the world trying to identify different kinds of markers which can be used to differentiate these two subgroups of people at high risk. And these fall into three broad types of marker. First of all, by doing, by, by testing people's cognitive function. So we know that psychosis is associated with um, difficulties with some aspects of cognition. Um, so the idea is, well, maybe if we test this in this high risk group, it might help us predict which people are going to be more ill are going to be ill in the future and who will not. Um, the other kind of approach is to, is to use brain scanning. So we know in, in psychotic disorders that there are changes in the brain that we can detect on a brain scan. So the idea here is to try and look in this high-risk group before the um, disorder begins to see if we can pick up changes that would predict who is going to become unwell later on. 
and then finally we've 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 used the same approach with measuring uh, molecules specific molecules in the blood and I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what that has revealed next so this is the this is the kind of idea behind what i was talking about you 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 have a person presenting at high risk for psychosis on the basis of a clinical interview it's impossible to know what will happen to them in terms of whether they become unwell or not so what we're trying to do instead is to assess what are called biomarkers which means some kind of biological measure which is different to a clinical assessment but which potentially could be used to provide new additional information that would help the clinician to predict what is going to happen to the patient so the first type of approach has been to to use cognitive testing and um this means trying to measure a memory function or um, the ability to plan or organize things in in this high risk group and and what these tests show is that um all people at high risk show some kind of impairment on these kind of tests but the severity of the impairment seems to be greater in people who are more likely to develop illness in the next year or two so if you look at the 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 size of the difficulties that people are having on these kind of tests the the the, the people who perform worst seem to be at higher risk than the people who perform quite well and um a lot of this testing is done using you know um you, you it's possible now to put these tests on digital um, portable devices like an ipad or or the patient's phone even so it's possible to do these tests in quite a simple quick way without it being a big burden for for the participant the the other kind of um test that we've been using is brain scanning so it's possible with um brain scanning to look at the structure and the chemistry and the function of the brain um in it um and and we've done this has been done in disorders like schizophrenia for many many years and it's and we know that there are changes associated with these disorders in these measures of brain chemistry function structure what we've discovered from using this before the onset of the illness is that people who are at high risk who later go on to develop psychosis show these kind of changes before the illness fully develops so this is a new discovery that um, these changes appear to occur before the full clinical experience of the disorder so what that means is it may be possible to use these kind of brain scanning information to predict which individuals are going to become unwell in the future and which will not and then finally the same kind of thing has been discovered from uh, measuring different proteins and other molecules in the blood so um, it's possible with a simple blood test to measure certain molecules that are in in the blood in high-risk individuals and find that the levels of these in the blood are higher in people who are going to develop psychosis in the future than not so again we have the possibility that these blood tests could be used to predict future illness so um what these what these studies suggest is that by measuring um by using brain scans by taking blood samples by doing cognitive tests we may be able to get additional information that will help the clinician to know what will happen to people in the future and, and specifically whether they will develop psychosis or not so this is very important um a very important kind of research advance because it translates into something that can be used clinically potentially however um one of the challenges in using it in a clinical setting is that you have to have you have to be able to use this kind of information that is in an individual patient so if i have a patient who comes to me 
and um, I want to know what will happen to them, I have to be able to use these kind of tests just to give a specific personalized prediction for that individual, because each individual is going to be different. And statistically, that is quite a challenging thing, a quite a difficult thing to do. And so in order to overcome this challenge, it's been necessary to use some very advanced kind of artificial intelligence um, statistical techniques, which are best described as machine learning. Um, so I'll try to explain what that means in the in the next slide. So the idea behind machine learning is that you 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 teach a computer uh, program to learn how what is that? Let's say we take a brain scanning measure, like in this slide, and um, we show the the computer um, model um, what a brain a typical brain scan looks like in a group of people who do not develop psychosis, and then in another group of people who will develop psychosis. And then the, 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 the computer algorithm figures out the best way of differentiating these two groups. And it comes up with what is called a classifier. And then we take our individual patient's data, in this case, a brain scan, and we show we present that individual's data to the computer algorithm, and it will tell us the likelihood that this individual corresponds to this group or to that group. In other words, to the, the group who are going to become unwell or the group who will not become unwell. And it gives a personalized percentage estimate. So it might say there is a 90% chance that this person will not develop psychosis and a 10% chance that they will. And on the basis of that information, that is information that is specific to that individual and that the clinician can then use to make a decision about that, in, that individual. So, for example, if the risk of them developing psychosis, according to this prediction, was very low, then the, the, the reason for intervening with some kind of prevention would be less than if the risk was very high, for example. So um, this kind of approach, this kind of prediction approach has, has developed to the point where um, it's possible to not just use information from one type of test, like a brain scan, but from multiple different tests and put all the information available together into a single computer program. So in this scenario, we have our individual who's at high risk and we want to know what their personal risk of becoming unwell will be in the future we can enter information collected from them on their cognitive function, from brain scanning, from measuring things in the blood, and integrate all this information in a machine learning model. And this will give the clinician an output which says the percentage chance of them not developing psychosis is some number, maybe 90%, and the percentage chance of them developing psychosis is 10%. And on the basis of that prediction, the clinician can then say, okay, the risk is very low, so I'm going to, uh, th there is not a need for a, an intensive preventive approach. On the other hand, if the risk was very high, then this would be provide uh, a rationale for uh, a preventive intervention in that individual. So this is why um, when we talk about prevention, it, it's very much linked to the ability to make predictions because for prevention to be efficient and ethical, um, it's very important to have information on the likelihood of the risk. And this, all of this prediction work gives potentially gives us this information. Okay, so um, I told you a little bit about um, research on try, trying to develop clever ways of predicting what will happen to people at high risk. Um, none of that would be of any value if we didn't have something to offer the people who are at highest risk. So if we have an individual who, according to our tests, has a very, very high risk of developing psychosis if we do nothing, then ideally we would want to be able to offer some kind of preventive treatment. So in parallel with all of this work I've described to you, there has been work on trying to identify treatments that could be preventive for psychotic disorders. And there have been a, a number of trials over the last 20 years, 
And what people did initially was just evaluated treatments that, that were already known to be useful in established psychotic disorders like schizophrenia. So for example, antipsychotic medication or cognitive therapy, for example. And the disappointing result from all these studies is that none of these existing interventions seem to work. So although there were some promising results initially, they were never replicated. So um, at the moment, we do not have a proven uh, licensed treatment that can prevent psychosis. Um, so this suggests that maybe, maybe we have to come up with a different type of treatment that is preventive instead of just trying treatments that already exist that are, are really used for, for treating established illness, maybe we need to have a different kind of approach for prevention. And so there has been a huge interest in trying to identify different types of treatment that may be preventive specifically. And one of these approaches, probably in my opinion, the most promising approach is to target a different kind of neurotransmitter system in the brain to the one that existing treatments work on. So existing treatments for, for disorders like schizophrenia target the dopamine system in the brain. This doesn't seem to work for prevention. But another transmitter system that seems to be very important for mental health is called the endocannabinoid system. This is a, a relatively recently identified system, but it does seem to be very, very important in terms of many, many um, brain functions and particularly functions related to mental health. And one of the, the potential preventive treatments targets this particular system in the brain. And that treatment is called um, cannabidiol. So cannabidiol or CBD, um, you may have heard about it in the media because um, it's possible to obtain uh, over the counter in, in uh, a chemist or pharmaceutical shop um, a version of cannabidiol. Um, but this is a little bit different from what I'm going to be talking about, which is pharmaceutical grade cannabidiol. So cannabidiol is an ingredient of the, the cannabis plant. So cannabis contains many, many compounds, but the two most important ones are um, cannabidiol or CBD, which is this one here, and THC, which is the, the compound in cannabis that gives you the, um, the psychoactive effects, but also can make, um, can make you paranoid and make you anxious. And it's very important. It's, it's a slightly confusing story this but what we are talking about is not this dangerous um ingredient that can make people unwell but cannabidiol which seems to have the opposite effect in other words what what if if what people discovered is if you extract pure cannabidiol from the cannabis plant screen but if you extract um cannabidiol from uh the the cannabis plant mm -hmm it emerges that this drug seems to have antipsychotic and uh, anxiolytic properties. In other words, it seems to reduce psychotic symptoms. It seems to reduce anxiety and it doesn't have any psychoactive effects. And so over the last 20 years or so, there's been huge interest in trying to use this molecule taken from the cannabis plant and use it as a medicine. And, and that's what I'm going to talk about in relation to prevention. Cannabidiol. So the key thing to understand about cannabidiol is that it's very distinct from the effects of cannabis. So what we're talking about is removing the pure molecule from the cannabis plant and then just looking at the pure molecule. And when you look at the pure molecule, it seems to have potentially beneficial effects for psychosis. Okay, next slide, please. So we have done um clinical trials um, with pure cannabidiol um, as a medicine in patients with psychosis and found that it seems to be um, very well uh, tolerated, doesn't seem to have any side effects, and also seems to reduce um, the symptoms of psychosis. So we did a study in 2018 showing this in, in patients with psychosis. And we've also, next slide, um, done the same kind of study uh, could you go to the next slide? 
um, in people at high risk. So in this high risk population, um, if we give this group um, cannabidiol, it seems to reduce their high risk symptoms. So this suggests that it might be useful as a preventive treatment in this high risk group. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this has led us to um, set up a kind of global um, clinical trial of cannabidiol. So we think that cannabidiol, if we give it to people at high risk, has the potential to be very safe, um, doesn't seem to have any adverse effects, but also to be able to relieve the, the, the high risk symptoms that people present with in this stage, but also potentially to prevent progression to a full-blown psychotic disorder. So in a study funded by the, the Wellcome Trust, um, we have set up a, a global trial involving about 35 sites, um, mainly in Europe and in North America, um, to, com to study the effectiveness of cannabidiol um, in this population. And uh, maybe if you move to the next slide, I can show you how this would work. So the idea of this trial is very, very simple design. Um, when a patient presents with the high risk uh, syndrome, we would invite them to receive the normal kind of supportive um, care that they would get um, in the absence of any trial. But in addition to simply ad add to this normal care, either um, cannabidiol or a placebo, which is a, a kind of um, dummy treatment. And we would uh, randomly allocate people to one or the other treatment and then we would offer this to them for two years and the reason for providing it for this period of time is that two years is the period of maximal risk so in this high risk population if the the, the risk of developing psychosis is only for the really for the first two years and after that the risk um declines again so the rationale of this study is to try and provide uh, kind of protection against progression to psychosis during this high risk period of two years. So that's why we're offering the treatment for this long time. So what we would do is provide um, treatment for this period of time to a large sample of people at high risk. And then we will follow up the group to see, first of all, in the short term, whether cannabidiol can reduce their symptoms. And secondly, in the longer term, whether it can reduce the risk of them progressing to developing a psychotic disorder. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so this is one example. Um, it's not the only way potentially that one could try and prevent a mental health disorder, but it's probably one of the most um, well-developed strategies um, among mental health conditions. Um, and we will probably know in a few years' time whether this particular approach using um, cannabidiol can be useful. And we, we, basically, we don't know. We have to do the, the clinical trial on a fairly large scale in order to get the answer. So at that point, I will, I will stop. I just would like to acknowledge all my colleagues who've contributed to the, the work that I've described to you. And I would be uh, very happy to take any um, questions that you might have or, or address any comments that you might have. Thank you very much for this very informative and very clear lecture. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. Professor Magari, my name is Bernard Poulin. I am uh, one of the uh, people of uh, your own team. So, first of all, I wish to thank you very much, really for your amazing, outstanding uh, lecture. I think it, it was really fascinating for all the, the, the attendees. And also in the name of the uh, neuron team, I wish to apologize for your, the, the intrusion <laughs> that has uh, disturbed uh, your uh, presentation. So I'm very sorry for that. So wh what I want to, to say is that we are very, very pleased that you have shared uh, with us, uh, with the audience, your long experience in the neurocognitive basis of psychosis, development of new assessment, 
treatment and uh, early detection of uh, psychotic uh, disorders. And uh, of course, I think uh, your, your lecture uh, opens clearly. It is fascinating because you mentioned that one at, uh, in a breakthrough period of time, uh, and, and uh, because you open the possibility that uh, early uh, that the detection of psychosis and the prodromic stage opens the possibility uh, for detecting it, for developing prevention strategies and also early intervention. So I, I, I think it, it's very important to have this in mind. And uh, of course, it, it is time to move uh, to the discussion uh, session. And uh, all the attendees uh, to, to this lecture are welcome for, for participating uh, to, uh, to the discussion. And of course, uh, you, will, uh, you, you will send uh, the question. It's, it's better to have uh, them and to uh, So in order to, to, to give uh, the attendees to, uh, the time to prepare the question, maybe I, I can start with uh, one question. So your presentation has highlighted, pinpointed uh, how it is important, uh, how important the, the connected devices, uh, the, the application on tablets uh, to, uh, to in cognitive uh, testing before the onset of disease. Do you envision that in the future, one can use this kind of device or tools in, the, in general population in order to to have a, to have a large uh, scale detection of yes. the early prodroma of a, of a psychosis yeah i mean well first of all thanks for your very kind uh, comments um yes i think it's a very interesting point so um you know the the, the potential for Kind of remote digital technology in this group who are, are essentially adolescents or young adults um, is huge because you're talking about people who have grown up with this technology and actually i mean in in, in our service um these individuals prefer contact through a device than face-to-face -face contact so for 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 this generation it's certainly in london um, they think it's very strange to go and meet somebody in an office and have a discussion. They would much rather interact interact through their phone. Um, so I think there is huge potential and uh, in terms of the acceptability of the approach. And also, um, you know, um, our patients generally do not enjoy lengthy uh, assessments. So one of the things we've tried to do, which I think is very important, is to make the um, assessments short and uh, kind of to gamify them almost in, in that um, instead of it being a, like an exam which is very um, difficult and long and, and humiliating um, make it more like a, a computer game which is short and enjoyable so, because then people are much more willing to do it and to do it again and this is if you're trying to monitor um, say cognitive function or symptoms remotely repeated measurement over the risk period is very important. So I completely agree with you that there is enormous potential for this. Um, and, you know, what I've been talking about is a kind of what, what is known as indicated prevention, where we're targeting a group who are already at increased risk. Um, but with these kind of um, digital devices, um, they could potentially be, you know, it is possible logistically to um, extend the availability of this to a broader population um, than, than just mm -hmm. the people at very high risk. And so there is a big potential there. I mean, another way to do it is instead of doing the testing through a device is to, to do it online. So you, it's possible to put the testing materials on a website and then invite people to log on to the website and do it that way. That's another way. And that is that um, studies like that can recruit. I mean, this was done during the COVID pandemic, for example, to look at psychological distress. And, you know, you can get 200,000 people um, from the general population logging onto the website and providing information. So it, um, it is, has got huge potential. Thank you very much. 
we have a question from uh, Viorica Kosaru. Sorry if I, yeah. uh, I did not yeah, approach it okay. correctly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, professor, thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Professor, I understood that uh, psychosis happens due to some fractures or some molecules which can be subsequently test, which can be discovered through testing or uh, and then you can give uh, whatever treatment is suitable. But my question is of a different nature. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent uh, uh, does the, an alien environment uh, can trigger such symptoms of psychosis? Yeah. And uh, why the same, why people living in the same alien uh, environment, some of them develop symptoms of psychosis and some of them do not develop? Yep. any kind of symptoms this is my question the importance on the environment of an alien environment yep. on the outburst of this psychotic system uh, yes. symptoms thank you. thank you it's a great question so i mean i think you use the word alien and i think that is a very useful term uh, because you, you know if you look at the the magnitude of the different risk factors for psychosis the biggest one is the is is being in an alien environment so you know probably we don't really know this but probably the reason that being an immigrant is such a big risk factor is that you are you are in an alien environment it's not necessarily about being an immigrant per se but being in a strange environment where you maybe don't feel so welcome and comfortable um so i think um understanding what it is about being in an alien situation um, is very, very important to understanding what causes psychosis because it, it, it's one of the biggest factors. And um, it seems to be related more to, to if, I, if, I'm the, if I'm the patient, um, my perception of the environment. In other words, um, even if I go to a, a, a nice place where people are very kind to me, if I perceive myself as being alien and unwelcome, then I will be at increased risk. Um, so, for example, we have a huge um, effect of being an immigrant in London, and yet London is probably quite a tolerant place in terms of um, immigrants and so on, in, in terms of interactions with people. But maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe just the perception, it, it, you know, even if people are being nice to me and they welcome me as an equal, if I believe that they are biased and prejudiced against me, then every time something goes wrong in my life, I can interpret it in a in a kind of paranoid way that it's because I'm an immigrant or because I'm different or because I'm alien. Mm -hmm. So I think you've touched on a really, really fundamental point about understanding what causes psychosis. Um, and we we don't really understand how that works. But being feeling alien for whatever reason, because you're disabled, because you're foreign, because you have a strange accent, um, seems to be a very big risk factor and it doesn't matter it's nothing to do with your skin color or your if i go to japan i will feel this i will be subjected to the same risk because i will feel alien it's it's nothing to do with being from africa or from the caribbean or from north africa it's it's nothing specific it's about um anyone being in a place where they feel alien for some reason it doesn't have to be to do with being an immigrant it could be because of some other factor and uh, yeah. so if if you may uh, if you allow me to continue a little bit are this are this uh, element of psychosis determined by an alien alien environment as dangerous for the human body as those symptoms which are developed due to genetic causes maybe or due to uh, fractures in the brain or due yeah. to missing of some molecules or some or something or they yeah. are less dangerous and they can be uh, uh, managed better yeah well it's a very difficult question i mean most sort of experts in this area think that um you have these environmental factors but there is some kind of interaction between these environmental factors and things like genetics and biological factors so it's not one or the other but some kind of interaction between the two and we don't really understand exactly how that works but um as you alluded to 
um, with environmental factors, you have the possibility of changing things. So if, for example, people feeling unwelcome in a society is a big risk factor, then potentially you could change that through some political or social action. It's not easy, but it's it's at least it's possible. Whereas with genetic factors and so on, you can't really do anything. Um, so the advantage of these environmental factors is that they're maybe more amenable to change and, and making things, making them less of a factor than some of the biological factors. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank You're you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yes, now we have two questions from uh, Nancy. One is a very general one, and one is uh, very interesting because it is about the common uh, uh, mechanisms to neurological and uh, psychiatric disease. So, Nancy, uh, okay. you are welcome to, to, to raise your question or Holly. Second. Okay. Um, sorry. I'm, I'm, if anybody else can ask a question because my alarm goes off. I can reach that point. Sorry for that. Um, well, my questions uh, were, um, what makes the brain change, uh, structure to change, even before the signs appear? Because um, you had the question from Vyrica, and you said that the environment is uh, one of the things that is important, but how do you explain the change in the brain, I don't think the environment, unless it's something we can touch or something that affects us, um, that can actually change our brain. You are muted. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, I was gonna say that's a really good uh, question. Um, we don't really understand what determines the alterations in the brain in psychosis but one of the um, ideas is that some of the changes you see in the brain are related to increased risk not to the disorder itself in other words if you are more likely or a more, have the, an increased risk of developing the disorder maybe your brain is slightly different and that's a kind of vulnerability uh, effect and then there may be other changes in the brain which are linked to actually having and expressing the disorder. So my interpretation would be that the, the, some of the changes that we see before there are any, um, before the disorder is even present, are, are linked more to vulnerability or risk than to the disorder itself. Um, because we know that many of the risk factors, genetic factors, um, childhood trauma, um, can alter the, the the way the brain develops. So this is a plausible possibility. And did um, you have a second question? Yes, I had. Um, you told us about um, the cannabis oil uh, yes. treatment. Yes. Um, but do you know the mechanism behind the improvement uh, yeah. of using that? Yeah. So, so it can be. A, this is a Nobel Prize winning question um so nobody knows um, i mean it, this is very very but it's a very very important question because um first of all there are a number of ways that cannabidiol um pharmacologically can act on the brain and there may be five or six established mechanisms the problem is we don't know which of these is the critical one for mental health um, so there is a whole load of research including the the, the, the study that i'm talking about where we're trying to um, study what happened, how the brain is affected when people are treated with cannabidiol to try and understand that. And the reason it's so important is that if cannabidiol is useful in treating mental health disorders, if we understand the mechanism of action, then this is a new therapeutic target. And we can, we can then potentially create other molecules or drugs that could target the same system. So understanding how it works is very, very, very important because it, it could lead to all kinds of other treatments that are acting on the same system, but not cannabidiol, but something else. And that may have slightly different or even better effects. 
So we don't know the answer to, to your question yet, but hopefully in maybe five years, we will have a better idea. So if I understand correctly, there's research going on uh, in that area. Yes. So, um, for example, in the in the trial, the trial that we're just about to start that I mentioned at the end of the talk, the big um, multi-center trial, we will be studying um, the patients taking part in that trial. We will be measuring uh, the brain function using brain scanning to look at how cannabidiol is altering um, the, the, the neuroimaging measures. And that will give us a clue as to how it's working in the, in the in the patient, so the mechanism of action. So um, this is a very, very active area of research. And um, um, yeah, so we, we should have some better information uh, in a few years. Thank you for your, your answer. And I, um, I think it's very interesting because like you said, a lot of people are affected by mental health issues. Uh, Absolutely. E yeah. Either um, minimal or mac. Uh, in, in a very large way exactly so uh, you do you're doing a very great job and thank you for your uh oh, lecture you're welcome. thank you <laughs> you're welcome. so uh Gana speaking so to all the audience so can you try to stimulate your brain in order to uh, to raise some uh, question <laughs> for professor magai right? because it's very important it's a it's a unique opportunity uh, uh, we have uh, to 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 uh, to have answer to uh, to very important question that we are facing together. So I, I have another one, uh, Doctor Ma, uh, Professor Magai. So how do you envision the relationship be, between the causal the common com uh, causal mechanism that link the psychiatric disease or mental health disease mm -hmm. to neurological disease? This is a question that is inspired by the second question of Nancy. So the question, if I can understand correctly, is the overlap, is it about the overlap between... Yes, oh, and yes uh, on the possibility that to have a common causal mechanism for, ah, for, okay. for the disease that sometimes... Uh, as a, as, a, yes. as a phenotype uh, classified as a neurotrigial okay. disease or psychiatric disease. Okay, okay. Well, um, I, I, I'm not an expert on neurological disease, but what I can tell you about is that, that, that within mental health disorders, there is a lot of overlap in terms of both the symptoms and in terms of the risk factors. So in my presentation, I mainly talked about risk factors for psychosis, but the, the same kinds of risk factors, uh, being a, an alien in, a, in, a, in society, uh, being subjected to childhood trauma or stress, uh, genetic factors um, are, are also applicable to depression, to bipolar disorder, to other conditions. So within mental health disorders, there is a lot of overlap both in terms of the risk factors and in terms of the symptoms. So you can experience psychotic symptoms if you have depression, if you have bipolar disorder, if you have dementia, for example. Um, a huge proportion of patients with um, psychotic disorders also have problems with mood and problems with anxiety. So um, for, for mental health disorders particularly, there is it, it is a real feature of these conditions that there is a big overlap between the traditional categories of schizophrenia, depression, and so on. And you know a lot of a lot of academics in in mental health ha, are, feel that the the traditional clinical diagnostic categories are maybe not, ideal because of that overlap um, because you have so much overlap if you take for example um, bipolar disorder and psychosis um, you can find many patients who it's very difficult to to decide whether they are one or the other because the symptoms are, are, are quite similar um, so I think it's a very important issue and that you know there have been some attempts about 10 years ago in North America they tried to introduce a kind of different disease classification system, which was which um, 
instead of having uh, clinical diagnoses and, and categories was more of a kind of dimensional system. So for each patient, you could have a score on mood, a score on cognition, a score on anxiety, and, and to, to classify these disorders in, in this kind of dimensional way. So this is a very live, within psychiatry, this is a very live controversial topic which is ongoing and um, uh, it's not clear what the best solution is, but it's really because this overlap that you've described is such a big feature of psychiatric disorders. Thank you very much, Professor Nakai. We have uh, another uh, very important and relevant question from Nancy about inflammation. Ah, Nancy, yeah. It is up to you. Yes, you you mentioned inflammation in uh, on one of the slides, yes. and um, I would like to know if that's an important issue in mental yeah. health uh, and mental yes. disorders because it is in some neurological disorders. Yes, uh, diseases. Sorry. <laughs> well, yes. So I think the answer is it, it it does seem to be an important issue. It's a relatively recent finding, um, and the finding really comes from measuring. Um, what are called inflammatory markers or cytokines in the blood. So what people found in, in just in the last 10 years or so is that when you measure the levels of these inflammatory molecules in patients with, say, depression or schizophrenia, they are at higher levels than in people who um, have no mental health problems. So that was the first clue that inflammation might be an important factor. And um, in our in the studies that I was telling you about in in the high risk population, one of the blood measures that seems to be elevated in people who later develop psychosis is are these inflammatory molecules. And then there's been um, so this is measuring uh, inflammation in in the kind of peripheral blood, um, but it's also possible to look at inflammation in the brain, or what is called neuroinflammation and there are one can use um a kind of scan called a pet scan to target um inflammatory cells the, the in within the brain and there is some evidence that these inflammatory cells may be more active in mental health disorders so um this has led to many pharmaceutical companies trying to develop treatments that are designed to reduce inflammation in order to treat mental health problems, for example. So it, it's a very, it's a relatively recent, but but very real um, area and uh, seems to be quite important um, in terms of mental health disorders in the same way as it is for neurological disorders. You said that pharmaceutical companies are um, looking into it. Um, is there anything concrete um, available well, or? There aren't any um, licensed treatments. There have been a number of clinical trials where people have used anti-inflammatory drugs, for example, to try and treat depression and reported that they actually had beneficial effects on mood, for example. So um, that hasn't translated into a licensed approved treatment, but there, it's suggestive that it might be helpful. Um, I mean, the other inflammatory area that is relevant is um, in some patients with um, psychosis, uh, the psychosis seems to be caused by um, auto, an, a kind of autoimmune problem where the patient is producing antibodies against one of the receptors in the brain. And that this actually seems to cause the psychosis. Um, so there's some evidence that in, in patients where this is the problem, uh, some kind of immunotherapy may be helpful. So that's, a, that, I mean, again, that is not a licensed established treatment, but there have been some recent clinical trials suggesting that that might be helpful. So inflammation seems to be an important um, potential new way of approaching these kind of disorders. Um Thank you for um, for answering. Um, I did um, listen when you said that uh, the, the I think it's the second slide where you had therapies for the different uh, uh, in the different studies, and you said overall it doesn't work. Um, 
this is um but, but what i was meaning there uh, nancy was um the first approach to trying to prevent psychosis was to yeah. give the same treatments that are used for established psychosis which was mainly antipsychotic uh, medications and these don't seem to work as a prevention so they seem to be quite good at treating symptoms once they are established but yeah. not the development of these symptoms in the first place that's what that's what i was meaning okay thank you you're welcome professor if you allow me to ask you one more question yes of course please. um are there any statistics uh, regarding the rate of the incidence of the psychosis based on genetical backgrounds yes so um the 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 genetics of psychosis is is quite complicated it, but it looks as if um there are about maybe 250 different genes that each of which can contribute a very small risk on its own and so the, the what seems to be the best guide to genetic risk is what's called the polygenic risk score so this means a kind of um you take let's say there are 250 genes that may be relevant to psychosis in in all of us we will we will have a different um a different variant of these genes and depending on how many of the 250 each of us carries that um, increases the, the the level of the risk so if you have all 250 of these genes then the risk would be high if you have only one or two then the risk would be low and this seems to vary um in the general population and so um the polygenic score is a measure of the number of risk genes of the many many risk genes that you carry but each one individually has a tiny tiny effect and so there isn't it's not like there's a single gene in uh, that, that seems to cause uh, psychosis it's it's a cumulative effect of many many different genes acting together that seems to be carrying the risk thank you professor you're welcome thank you so i have uh, seen a question to the audience to the attendees do you have a other questions? It is time. <laughs> After it will be too late. <laughs> hmm. So, if there is a, absolutely no question, it means that it is time to, to close with this uh, fascinating okay. session. There is actually a question from Nancy. Yes, I, I wanted to, um, well, I wanted to know, um, we are all uh, connected to Aranet neuron um, and um, we function as um, patient, uh, well, we read proposals for uh, neurological studies. Um, so I wanted to ask a question regarding to the patients in your clinical trial. Um, mm -hmm. What was the burden for them? Because uh, it can't be easy um, being a patient with psychosis or leaning to psychosis and getting a placebo and see that in the other one it works and it doesn't work in your case. Yes, it's a very good point. I mean, what we wanted to do was to be able to offer people who were, who were randomly given the placebo at the end of the study to offer them cannabidiol so that they had the opportunity of getting it. The problem is that the, um, the logistics of that made it too expensive because um, this is, involves 500 people. So the cost of providing um, cannabidiol to people um, in both arms w w would be too much for that to be, to be feasible, but that was our original idea. So, um, but I should emphasize that um, for this particular high-risk group, um, generally speaking, these individuals find it helpful to uh, to be able to access the generic supportive care that everyone is getting. So even if they only get the placebo, um, they would still get a, they would subjectively derive a lot of benefit from the supportive care that they would also be that everyone would be provided with. So um, we think 
which is the standard care. So at the moment, if you, you if you weren't taking part in this trial, the, the kind of care you would be getting would be the same as the people in who were getting the placebo. So um, I, I do appreciate what you're saying, but it's still it's not like we're just giving them a placebo and nothing else. They they get all kinds of additional advice, support, and practical help in addition to the the medication. Yeah, I uh, I do agree, and uh, I think um, it's the the best way of uh, supporting them. But don't you encounter, um, like you said, um, people with um, high risk um, psychosis symptoms, or uh, like in at the start, um, they don't um, interact one on one. Um, with a, a caregiver uh, from your from the Oasis or or any other institute, but um, how do you get them to join uh, yeah. a clinical trial? Yes, well, it's uh, so it's not in some. I mean, it's not so easy. I think you have to um, try and explain to them the potential benefits. I think. In this high risk group, there are one of the differences with this high risk group compared to patients with established psychosis is that they are much more interested in receiving help than patients after psychosis has started when often the patient is, is quite reluctant or ambivalent about having any kind of clinical care or treatment. The high risk group seems to be quite different in that they are, in my experience, the most um, interested and enthusiastic um types of patient in terms of looking for care and and that seems to be related to having quite a high level of insight in understanding that there that there is something uh there is something clinically wrong which they they need to do something about uh -huh. so um although we you know you have to do a bit of work to overcome the um the, uh, the kind of caution that many people have about for, the, the, for these people, this is the first time they've ever had any contact with mental health services. And so you have to overcome this kind of um, caution that many people would have because it's the first experience of this kind of thing for them. But on the other hand, um, usually they, they are, I mean, these are people who are coming forward, volunteering, asking for help. So it's, it's not, there is no, um, coercion involved here these are people who approach us and say something is wrong here can you help me so um it's not so difficult with this particular population i mean this is one of the advantages of the preventive approach in that you you know um you have it's actually easier to engage with the patient than after the illness certainly for psychosis after psychosis is established then it's much more difficult to interact and engage with patients than it is before the onset uh -huh. so for me this is one of the big advantages potentially of this kind of early detection approach because um the chances of the patient engaging with the um the system and following the advice and using the advice um seems to be higher um so for example in in our service um in in a in if, if say if I was running a clinic for patients with um, established psychosis, maybe fifty percent of the appointments nobody would uh, nobody would arrive for the appointment. If we were doing it for for a high risk population, the figure would be maybe eighty or ninety percent attendance. So it's you, you know the 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 engagement with clinical care seems to be easier and. Um, more more efficient so this is another argument for in terms of health health provision costs every time you miss an appointment is wasting money because you have the clinic an expensive clinician sitting in the clinic seeing nobody for half an hour um so you know looking after patients with established illness can be very expensive from that point of view for the health provider if most of the the, the patients who you're offering help to attend and use the information then the, the, this is less expensive so yeah. thank you very much okay thank you so uh, i think it is time to close this uh, session uh, uh,
as there was a, a number of very relevant questions, it has clearly uh, exploded the time. <laughs> But I, I think it is a very important time uh, to, uh, to, to share uh, to, uh, for this discussion between uh, different uh, attendees and the lay audience and, and the specialists. So I, I wish in the name of uh, Aeronet, the own team, and uh, also of the funding agencies that fund the neuron, I wish especially to thank you very much, uh, P Professor Magai, for the time that I've given and for this amazing lecture and discussion with uh, the attendees. Of course, I wish to thank especially the two attendees, Nancy and Vic and Viorica, that has uh, fueled the discussion by, uh, by their discussion. And uh, this was very important. So thank you to everybody. We learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much so much. Well, thank, thank you. It was a pleasure. Really enjoyed it.